How about now? Oh, that's weird. I must have turned the wrong way. Start again. It's amazing. No. <laughs> but we should be free. If the Bible says, whom the Son set free is free indeed, we should live by that. So we should have no hang-ups, no fear, no regret, no shame, no guilt, no condemnation, none of that stuff. Because Jesus died to set you free. No, no fear, no doubt, um, no lack, no lack of anything. It's amazing. So someone was asking me, um, what about the demonic realm? It's real. The, the spiritual world is more real than the physical world that we can see. Absolutely it is. There is angels and demons and things fighting all around us. And, you know, the Bible says that there's ministering angels and, that we, you know, we have guardian angels. So that makes sense that we all have a, a demon that's trying to wipe us out too. But our angels and God and the Holy Spirit and everything is protecting us from all that stuff. Like, we'll, hopefully we'll get into. But we don't have to fear it. Amen. Because I'm better than that thing. Because greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. So we don't have to fear it. We don't have to be part of it. And this is why this whole, uh, like I said on Sunday, I briefly mentioned it on Sunday, the whole courts of heaven stuff. Don't know if you ever heard of it. It's not biblical. You know, I don't know if you, again, don't, please don't look into it. If you, but basically the, the, the gist of it is that the devil has a legal right to you as a Christian. And that you have to go to God's courtrooms and plead your case before God. I don't, I don't ha, and, and then God will determine your case and plead your case and all that kind of stuff and the devil comes and accuses you and him and God are having this battle like you're some sort of a court case. How can that happen when God found me not guilty? Even if I mess up, the devil has no legal right to me like Curry explained yesterday. He has no legal right to me. And even if I mess up, I go to God and I say, hey, listen, I messed up. Father, forgive me. Done. There's no court case against you. The devil has no legal right to you. Like we talked about yesterday, long, uh, uh, Luke 10.19 says that he has given us all authority over the, over the ability of the enemy. If we have all authority over his ability, then how can he take me to court? And how, Why do I have to go to heavenly places? The Bible is very clear. It says I am seated in heavenly places in him. It doesn't even say with him. It says in him because with him there's a separation. But in him... There's no separation. I am seated in heavenly places in Christ. I live there. And I live here. Just like he lives there and he lives here. So I'm in two places at one time and he's in two places at one time. Has to do with quantum physics and all that stuff, right? Which I'm not an expert in. But I live there. I live in my father's house. So what does he have against me? Nothing. It puts people in bondage. Every bit of it. So we're going to look at this. Ephesians, this is not part of this, but this was a question, so we're going to get into it. Um, we'll read it quickly. We, we know this, where it says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, all right? Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse, starting in verse 12. I want to go through this quickly, but it says, uh, verse 13, wherefore not unto you take the whole armor of God, okay? Now, people get up every day, and they put on the whole armor of God. Don't do that, okay? Here's a question for you. I understand the reason why you do it. You want to get up, put the whole armor of God on, you know, put the helmet of salvation on. Why did you take it off? <laughs> what happened if you died in your sleep? My wife said that to a lady once. She said, I gave her more than my husband. I put the helmet. She said, why'd you take it off? If you died, would that mean you went to hell? She was like, what are you talking about? No, the, the, the implication here is, is that you put it on once and for all. When you become part of God's army, you put on that salvation. You put on that helmet of salvation. You put on the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. You put on the you put all that the belt of truth, all that kind of stuff. You put it on once and for all. It's done. But we think we have to go through this whole ritual, the boon, to do, to do, do all this stuff. It's not true. I don't take mine off. I'm ready to go. You know, there's there's one lady we had call us from from Saskatchewan, and she said, "I'm pleading the blood of Christ." Okay, I, I understand that to a certain point. And she's like, no, literally, I go to the store and I buy pig's blood and I pour it on myself. Okay, well, you might want to stop doing that. <laughs> but she literally bathed herself in pig's blood. Bondage. 
You know, the, the Bible, we won't get into this, but the Bible talks about the weak and the beggarly elements of the world, right? You know what? And then there's a list after that. You observe times, days, months, years. What's that talking about? Sabbath days, fastings, and all these Christian rituals that were under the law. You get all these people that say, we have to do this and do this and get on these, all these different fasts and all these different stuff. The Bible calls that bondage. Just saying. I'm not saying that you shouldn't fast. I'm not saying you can't have a Sabbath day. I'm just saying, you know, some people think, I, I can't lift a finger on the Sabbath. He is our rest. That's part of the finished work of, of Christ. He is our rest. So you don't have to get into all these rituals. If you want to fast, go ahead and fast. The Bible says you should, but you don't, it doesn't say you must. It doesn't say you must do these things. So people keep all these, these rituals that actually the Bible calls bondage. It's amazing to me. So take a whole armor of God that you'll be able to withstand in the evil day having done all to stand. That basically means have all, you've done everything to do, stand. Stand what? Ready for battle again. Why? Because you never take it off. You're always ready. Therefore, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace means what? Go. I got in trouble one time for preaching a, preaching a go gospel. That's the first time I ever called a heretic. Big long email. Because I preached go. Show me anywhere in the Bible says stay or stop. It doesn't. It never tells you to wait on God in that sense. I mean, there's certain things you're waiting, you know, for something to happen and God's doing some things and, but it never tells you to wait to go preach the gospel, to go be Jesus to the world. It's a religious excuse. You ever notice I hate religion? Ever? <laughs> but uh, you know what? I said this to, to Curry and, and to George. The more I care, the less I care. The more I care about the truth, setting people free, helping people, the less I care what everybody thinks of me. You can call me a heretic because I'm preaching the word of God. You're gonna, you're, you can call me all these names. They said the same thing about Jesus. I'll take it. I'm reading scripture, and if you call me a heretic, the issue is not with me. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you will be able to stand and, and quench. So that's what I want to get to, this, this part right here. The shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. It doesn't say some. It says all. So what does that mean? The devil can't touch you. All mean all. But the, what does it mean? The devil can't touch you. You will quench every fiery dart of the enemy. You know that, that some of these shields, I mean, they were huge. And they, uh, they were made out of wood, some of them. And they soaked them and they dipped them in water and they kept them soaking at night. Uh, and you went in there and these, these massive, they weren't this little tiny, they were huge. And the, if the fiery art, the darts would come, they would go in there and the water would soak that out. Well, what does water represent in scripture? Several things, but spirit, but the water of the word. So you live by the word, you confess the word, you get this in you and it'll quench every fiery dart of the wicked because it's your faith. Your faith is, can come from this. So the devil can't, this, this says right here that you will quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Literally, it's talking about like, if you break it down, it's talking about missiles that are pointing at you, all this other kind of stuff. But the devil should not be able to touch you. Yet the devil runs amok in most Christians' lives because they don't believe scripture. That's our hardest job is to try to get Christians to believe this book. But it says that you will quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. So that means you can live because the Bible says that your life is hidden in Christ. Most people's lives aren't hidden in Christ because they're living out of the soul, not living out of the spirit. But you live according to this word, the devil can't find you. You know, you may, heard, you may have heard Curry's uh, description of they were teaching or something in Las Vegas at one point in time and they were walking down the road and there was a guy with, on, with a little, little table and he had the little three shells. Like, you know how they do that? Where's the ball? Yeah, give me your 10 bucks or whatever. And he was, the guy was mixing it all around like this and Curry was watching. And then they would look it up, and then you, you, if you guessed, then you got a prize or something like that, or whatever you did, and it cost you whatever money you put down on the table. And Curry was watching that, and that's where God said, that's you. And Curry said, what do you mean that's me? The little, the little pea that's inside that? Or what? Like, what am I? And he's moving it around, and he said, no. It's the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and you're hidden. 
and the devil can't see you. So you open one, no, no, that's not there. Who's there? Jesus, you know, and then next one, oh, where's Curry? No, that's the Holy Spirit. The next one, where's Curry? No, there's God, you know. So God showed him that because your life is hidden in him. You're in them. He's in you. And the wicked one can't touch you. But only if you're living like that. See, if you believe that, the, like Curry taught it yesterday, so I don't want to go back over it, but the devil has no authority in your life. If you believe he has authority, then he can convince you of that. And a lie only has power if you believe it. See, if I tell you something that's completely opposite of who you are, you won't believe it. But if I tell you something with a little bit of truth, then it becomes believable. And even if it's only 10% truth, you're going to believe that, and then it's going to perpetuate, and it's going to build into something much bigger than itself. But you know that rat poison is only actually about 5 to 10% strychnine? Think about it. So if it's 95% you know, cornmeal and different things like that, and it's only 5% bad or maximum of 10% bad, why don't you eat it? Because it'll kill you. Is that true? Yes. It's, it's designed to kill. What about partial truth? It's designed to kill. What does John 10, 10 say? The thief comes, but to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay? You know what the word thief means? Does it mean Satan? Now I have you thinking. It does, because he's the thief. He's a, he's a murderer. He's a liar. He's all that kind of stuff. I taught this when we were in Edmonton, and this little guy sitting in the front, and he had his phone out, and he was, all these things that I said, this is what it is in the Greek, you check it out and stuff. And, and he's like, you're right. So I know I'm right. That's why I'm preaching it. The Greek word for thief there is, the, is a word used for a false teacher. For real. So a false teacher, what does he do? He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what religion does. It actually means when you go into it and break it down, it actually means that one who teaches, it, it actually also means an embezzler. Does not fall in line with false preachers because usually it's about money, yeah. right? They're embezzling your money. So they, you know, you come down, give us, your, give us your money, give us all that kind of stuff, pay for your healing, and all that silly stuff. But it means one who's teaching for his own self-gain and doesn't actually care about the people he's teaching. Anybody got a, a Strong's Concordance on their phone? Check it out right now. Go ahead. When I f Not that long ago, God said to me, what does the word thief mean? I searched it out, and I, was, I built a whole sermon on that and taught on that. False teacher. That's why I'm against them, because they're putting people in bondage in a several different ways, financially, spiritually, soulishly, even physically, because religion will make you sick. It will, because it brings condemnation. <laughs> Depression can make you sick. Stress is a killer. Probably 80% of sicknesses out there is caused by stress. And we live in a world that keeps you so crazy busy that you get stressed out. You can be so stressed out doing nothing, but yet you're stressed out. You can be as busy as you've ever been in your life and be at rest. Because you're in Him. You see, when you operate in God's strength, you never burn out. Ministers and preachers and different things like that, they usually leave ministry not because they don't love God. They leave because of people. Right? Like, I'll tell you something. I never got a heretic email when I was in the world or even when I was not preaching the truth. We preached, we drove around, we traveled prophetically. We were a, were a prophetic voice for, for people we traveled with. We went all over the place. I went up and teached in tents in the Northwest Territories. We went all over the place. Not one time did I ever get called a heretic. Why? Because I wasn't preaching the truth. You preach the truth and they'll call you a heretic. Isn't that crazy? The power of God shows up in a building and they think you're a devil. Same thing they said about Jesus. The church wouldn't recognize Jesus if he showed up. They would, they'd want to push him out. Seriously. Because it's opposite of what he thought. All these things are coming on. I'm not getting, I, I don't know. This church we belong to. 
these are all real stories. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not thinking them up. This church we belong to, for years, there'd be homeless people sleeping outside the church, and they called the cops. Call the, call the police, call the police, have them arrested, have them arrested, have them arrested. I show up there one day with my wife, and there's this guy named Bruce Markwart sleeping out, didn't know his name at the time. But uh, somebody came out to me because when homeless people would come in, stinky, dirty, drunk, angry, fighting, I mean, all that stuff, give them to Marty and Bridget, give them to Marty and Bridget. That's good. That, I, I, I got no issues with that whatsoever. That's what would happen. They said somebody's sleeping outside. Okay, no problem. It's minus 40 at this time. It's cold. I mean, you don't, you don't survive out minus 40 for more than a couple of minutes. And you, you, within about two minutes, your skin freezes. You know, it's, it's cold. It can get so cold where we're from. And we're on the southern part of Canada, by the way. We're not in the northern part. In the southern part of Canada, when you go outside, by the time you get out to your vehicle, your lungs are burning. If you ever kind of any facial hair, it's froze. Right? And it, you take a breath in, and it'll make you cough because they are so cold. Right? It gets down to... Sometimes about minus 40 degrees, okay? It's cold. And then in the northern part of Canada, Northwest Territories and things with the wind, it can get up to eight, minus 80 degrees. Okay, they got to leave their vehicles running 24 hours a day because they won't, anyway, I'm not going to get into that. So when, when Curry talks about coming to Canada, he's like, I'll come in like July or August or something <laughs> like that for, you know, we have those three days that are, you know, but uh, we, have, we have extreme seasons. So in the summertime, it's, it's 80, 90 degrees, like in Fahrenheit for you guys. So we get extreme, t- but when it's cold, it's cold, you know? And um, anyway, so this man was sleeping outside, and I went out there, and I started talking to him, and I asked him what his name is, and he told me. And I said, why don't you come inside? And he said, no, I'm just, I'm laying out here hoping to die. He said, I have, a, I have a mon- pneumonia now. I have full-blown AIDS, um, I, and I've had pneumonia 11 times, and I just want to die. And uh, I said, he ain't dying on my watch, you know? And I said, just come inside. And there was, there was coffee and cake and donuts and all this stuff inside. And all these people that probably ate breakfast already are in there eating all this stuff, yet there's a guy dying on the outside of their building. Now, one of you had the love of Christ in you to bring him a cup of coffee or a donut or some darn thing. You're too worried about stuff in your face. I get a little angry over stuff like this. And he was just laying out there. He said, I just want to die. And he wouldn't come inside. So I brought him, I brought him the stuff. And the, the pastor said, call the police. I said, I'm not going to call the police. I went and talked to the man. And I sat with him and I learned his story. It's amazing what you learn if you sit with somebody for five minutes instead of judging them. And I walked back inside and I'm crying and I said, please don't call the police. His name was Bruce Marquardt. He's got full-blown AIDS. He's got sores all over his body. And pneumonia 11 times. He's got pneumonia now and he's just waiting to die. But he had, he had something called MRS, a very transmittable disease. And they wouldn't take him into the shelters and different things like that. I touched him. Never got it. Never will. Brought him in. Nobody gave him the time of day. We put him up in a hotel. Did everything that the, the, the shelters wanted us to do to bring him into a hotel. Or to bring him into the shelter. And, he, and, he, and, and they wouldn't. Every hoop they asked us to jump through. We did it. And at the end, they said, we won't take them. Why didn't you, why did you tell me that in the first place? So we used to support this place. I won't support it anymore. Put him up in a hotel. Eventually, we lost track because he, was, you know, he's, he wasn't living a good life. And I got a note one day with blood on it. The pastor gave it to me. He tried to commit suicide. Blew half his face off. You know, and I lost, I lost track of him, so I never got... But the whole moral of that story is this guy's outside... You guys have food in your building, and then you get up on stage and you talk, start preaching and, and, and singing about the love of God. Yet there's a man dying outside your building. It's like Curry said, it's not just spoken; it's shown. It's deed. But this is again, this is what we, this is what we grew up in, and I grew up in the sense of our Christian walk. It's it's. Sh- I told I got mad at people. This guy sleeping outside your church had, should have the busiest agenda of anybody in the church because last week I took him out for lunch, this time it's your time, next time it's your time, you know what I mean? Everybody should be vying for a place in that man's life. How can I bless you? But everybody pushed him aside. How do you stay in that? Anyway, this says that the wicked one, he, that he can't touch you, right? That every fiery dart. Now we're going to quickly go over. 
This was supposed to be quick, but it just didn't happen that way. <laughs> now we're in 1 John 5, 18. This is having to do with the demonic realm and the, the you know, influence of Satan. He can, a person can only have influence in your life. An actual physical person can only have influence in your life if you let them. Okay. Now, just like Curry said, it doesn't matter if you leave the door open or not. It doesn't give the devil authority or anything. You can do things in your life that, that give the, the devil easier access, if you will. You know what I mean? Like if you're living in sin and you're, you're, you know, you're chain smoking, let's say, then it's easier for you to get lung cancer. Okay? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's coming from the devil. It could be a physical sowing and reaping thing. Okay? But there's definitely things in our lives that we can do that uh, you know, sort of agrees with the devil for him to work in your life. It's the same thing with God. There's things you can do in your life to agree with God so he can work in your life. Believe it or not, God and the devil are after the same thing. They're after your life. They want to get you know, control, so to speak, over your life. And, and most Christians have given the control over, if you will, I hate the word control, but you know what I mean, over or influence to the devil. Okay? Now we're going to read this. 5.18, 1 John 5.18. We know that, I covered this on Sunday, but we know that whosoever is born of God sins not. What it means what? Doesn't commit habitual sin. It doesn't mean, see, some people take this and say, well, I'm born of God, so I sin not. So I can get away with whatever I want because it's all covered under grace. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. Period. Hyper grace is wrong. It is dead wrong. It's for people who want to live however they want to live and get away with it because I'm born of God, so therefore I sin not. No, what that means is you don't practice sin because the Bible is very clear. In Colossians 3, Ephesians 5, Galatians 5, we can go to it if we need to. It says that if you do any of these things or such like, you will not inherit the kingdom of God, period. Now, we know that's not talking about the world, because we already know the world, the unsaved, the heathen are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So it's talking and addressed to the church that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. What about Matthew chapter 7? Not everybody who says, you know, in that day they'll come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? Did we do all this stuff? And Jesus never said, no, you didn't. He said, yeah, but I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. So does sin matter? Of course it matters. The Bible says to present your body a living sacrifice. It matters how you live. Because the worst thing that I would ever hear is getting up and thinking and having the illusion of freedom and getting up before Jesus and he says, you know what? You, you did some stuff. But I didn't know you. Depart from me. Those would be the, I don't care. Collectively, we could take every hurt that's ever been in this building. Put it all together, and it won't hurt like that. Because by that time, it's too late. It matters how you live, for sure. And it has to do with the devil having, you know, sometimes free reign in your life, okay? Now, again, he has zero authority. This is why it's so easy to beat him. And a person can only have authority in your life if you let him. Just like I said earlier, a lie can only have effect in your life if you believe it. But this is here. Then we know that whoever is born of God sin is not, and he that is begotten of the Son keep himself, keep himself what? Out of sin, from habitual sin. And look at this last part. And that wicked one touches him not. Is that pretty plain? Even Jesus said, hey, listen, I'm not going to be with you much longer. Here comes the wicked one, but he's got nothing in me. The devil has no right to you. He has no authority in your life. He cannot touch you. He has no free reign in your life. He has no free reign over your family's life. He only has what you sort of allow him to have. I, I, I hate that term too, but I can't think of you know, anything better than that. You know, If you leave the front door open to your house, a thief still has no right, just like Curry said yesterday. He has no right to you, but it is a little easier for him to get in because he doesn't have to break it down, yeah. Okay. Um, and when you believe lies, when you believe religion, the devil has the ability to get into your mind. And it, it, if the devil didn't have ability, it wouldn't say ability in the Bible. But he does have ability. He's just got no authority. Okay? And he's really powerless against you when you're walking in the spirit of God, right? When you're walking in the truth of God. This is why the truth is so important. Because when you understand the truth and you understand that the devil has no right to you, no legal right to you, he can't touch you, he... he 
he can't run amok, he can't put a sickness or disease or anything on you. Man, you live free and you're not living in fear. All these people that's going around in the world right now, it's, even Christians, it's because they don't believe the Word of God. If you believe the Word of God, you would go out there and lay hands on the sick. Just like John Lake, and Curry's told the story before. John Lake went out when there was, you know, all the stuff going on in South Africa and people were dying all over the place. And I think it was called black water disease or whatever it was called. And people were dying. They went in and pulled all the bodies out. People were dying. The doctors were dying. All this stuff was happening. And John Lake went and he went down there and he pulled the, you know, the bodies out and did all the stuff and took care of people. And they were like, how are you not doing this? And he quoted Romans 8 too. For the law of the life of the spirit um, of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. He quoted that, Romans 8 too. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And he took that, a sponge with a disease on him, and he, he took it, and they, mag- they uh, put it under a microscope, and they saw all the germs and things, and he put it in his hand, and he left it there for a few seconds, gave it back to him, and they checked it out, and all the germs were dead. That's how this should work. You should be able to go wherever, whenever, however, and disease should not touch you. Why? Because it didn't affect Jesus, and he lives in you. The biggest thing is you just got to believe it. You can take that book of, of confessions and say it until you're blue in the face. If you don't believe it, it's not going to do you one ounce of good because you got to believe it, right? So anyway, so if generational, we're still on generational curses, believe it or not, but um, if generational curses existed, wouldn't Jesus have taught them? He was the, he was the great teacher, right? You think, it, you think he would have taught it. This is as close as we come to any kind of mention of generational curse in the New Testament, okay? John 9, verse, verse 1. You see it on page 126 in your manual at the bottom. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that, would he, that he was born blind? Now, this would be a really good opportunity for Jesus to say, well, I'll tell you, this guy's grandfather, he was a real piece of work. You know, and this is what he did, but he, but he didn't. What did he say? Neither. Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but the works of God should be made manifest in him. So people take this and they use this and they say, You see, God makes people sick just to bring himself glory. He's not that arrogant. I'm going to hurt you just to set you free. That makes. The Bible says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. So therefore, Jesus went around healing everybody who was sick. Jesus, uh, Curry taught this. He went around healing all who oppressed the devil, all who were made sick, right? For God was with him. So what does that mean? That Jesus was God's will in the flesh, okay? So God's will must be that everybody is healed because he was, the, he was that, right? So this is not saying that God made him blind just so Jesus could do something. Jesus was saying, hey, listen, it doesn't matter how he got it. He didn't get it through a generational curse. Watch this. Set the man free. So the glory of God could be shown. That's all this was. And then he goes on to say, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Um, the night comes which no man can work. So what's he saying? Is I, I, I won't be able to do this anymore. I got to do this now when I'm on the earth. See, we think when we get to the, you know, the, the good old by and by and you know, when we get to heaven, boy, everything's going to be great. Yeah, that's true. But why can't everything be great here? There's no devils in heaven. There's no sickness, disease, sorrow, pain, guilt, shame. None of that stuff's in heaven. So where does the work start? Here. The Bible says what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Who's in charge of the binding and loosing? We are. But we're going, Jesus, why are you letting this happen? God, why are you letting all the suffering happen? God says, why are you letting you happen? Why are you letting it happen? You do something about it. Why are, why are all these kids starving? Why are you letting that happen? Why are you letting it happen? Generally, because we don't want to part with our mind. He said, I am, as long as I am the light of the world, or as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And he uh, had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. We don't know for sure, but we've heard it taught, and I tend to believe it. The reason he did that and made the clay and everything like that was because the man was probably born without eyes, and Jesus created them, because man was made out of the dust of the earth, and he created eyes. Come on. We'd like to see that, eh? And then it goes on and tells him, you know, all that kind of stuff because we don't have much time left here before we break for lunch. But it goes through and it says all this stuff. But Jesus never taught a generational curse. Not one time. This would have been the opportunity to do it. He never did it, so therefore it doesn't exist. Okay? 
And that is one of the biggest lies in the, in the church today and has been. And it goes away and it comes back and they, they call it something else. And then it goes away and it comes back and they call it something else. The devil has nothing new. He just repackages the same old trash in a fancy new box and calls it something else. And we go, ooh, look, shiny. And we open it up and it's the same rubbish on the inside of it in a fancy, in a fancy new box. Or a, or a very charismatic teacher, you know, that runs around and, you know, has a lot of emotional stuff. You know, he draws you in emotionally. And he's, you know, we, we even have preachers now that are on stage that are swearing. I mean, using really bad words. And, and they're, oh, I love my preacher. He's so relevant. Relevant to what? Sin? You, 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 oh, come on. I tell you, it's, some days it's hard for me to be in a church. But anyway, again, not this one. Um, so this goes on to say, so, so he gets healed and he, he gets set free. And then the Pharisees are going, what happened? And his parents were chickens and they're like, uh, you know, we don't know what happened to him. Of course they knew what happened to him. So he goes in there. This is, I just want to get to this last part and then we're going to, they're going to break for lunch. So they're giving him the gears. They're saying, hey, what happened? You know, what, what happened to your son? How did he get healed? Who healed him? What's going on? And the parents are saying, well, I don't know. He's of age. Ask him. So they ask him. We're in verse uh, 24 on the next page. And then, called, and then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise. We know this man is a sinner. Talking about G Jesus, right? He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind and now I see. So whoever this guy is, whatever, I can see and I was born from, from, I was blind from birth. Then they said unto him, what did he do to thee? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already because he already given an account of how this actually took place. I, I've told you already and you did not hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? What a slap in the face. Right? Like here, you're calling him, they called him Beelzebub and all this other kind of stuff. You're doing the, the works of this by the devil and all this other kind of stuff. And the problem, like Curry said yesterday, wasn't the fact that he was healing. It was the fact that he was healing on the Sabbath. You broke a religious tradition. Well, the Bible says that the tradition of man makes God's word of, or God's power makes God's word of no, none effect. Your traditions, when you say, wow, like Curry was saying yesterday, I don't care if you're part of this church or this church or this church or whatever part of the church you're in. If you're in tradition, you're making the power of God of none effect. And they have a form of godliness denying the power. This is what the church needs. Because if preaching would do it all, the whole world would be saved. Because the world's been preached to for the most part. But it's the power. It's the undeniable power of Jesus Christ that will change things. So you can try to convince somebody of the word, but if they can't believe it, show them. Even Jesus said, if you don't believe me for my word's sake, believe me for the works. And we say, wow, we don't need works. I had somebody say, well, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. You know, I was a Jehovah's Witness. I don't want to get back into the works. The Bible says you're saved unto good works. So we're supposed to be doing stuff. And we will give an account. Every one of us will be judged. See, people, people think that we won't be judged. We will be judged. We just won't be judged for our sin. Well, there's a different judgment for us as it is for the world. We'll get judged for, for, for what fruit. The Bible talks about that. It said you'll be rewarded. It talks about different works, the wood, the hay, the stubble, and the, all that stuff, right? What's going to be burnt away? Are your works going to last? What are your works based on? And you'll be rewarded according to your works. People don't like that because it puts a responsibility on them. I'm trying to... I want a reward. I want a front row seat. You know? Some people are just happy to squeak in the gate when it, you know, sort of catches their foot when they're going in the door. I want a front row seat. Whatever that means. I don't know what it means. I just want to be with him. And I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's all I want to hear. Those will be the best things you ever heard in your life. But people don't want that. They just, they just want to get through life and however they get through it. But the Bible says that you're saved unto good works. We're supposed to be doing good works works but unfortunately religion has sullied works and they've turned it into works for salvation it's not works for salvation like i said before it's works because of salvation because you get a new heart in you because you get a new demeanor because you get new character new nature you can't not but want to help but it, says, it clearly says if you don't want to the love of the father is not in you that's a hard one you know you know We'll finish up, but the, the, one of my favorite things, it's, it's rough, but it says it. It says, if, if you say you're in him and you don't, you don't live after him, you don't do the things he's doing, you're a liar. 
and the truth is not in you. That's what the Bible says. See, I, can, I get to preach that, and, and if it offends you, it's, it, it's not me offending you. Like, talk to the guy who wrote the book. But it says if you don't do, if, if you don't do basically what you're supposed to do, you're a liar, and the truth isn't in you. And it goes on to say that if, if, if you do, well, we'll just, we'll, we'll, Curry can finish this up. I keep saying he's he's probably watching, and he's. I keep saying that. But uh, here, so I'm not used to these Bible with these little tabby thingies, and I'm trying to trying to find them. Let's go over to John 14. I think I just bent one of your pages. I'm gonna sign this too when I'm done. I love this man. John 14:15. You there? Not in your Bible? Or not in your manual, but it is in your Bible. John 14, 15 says, if, well, for, John 14, 14 says, if you shall ask anything in my name, that I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you don't keep his commandments, what does that mean? You don't love him. Oh, I love Jesus with all my heart, soul, and mind. But I don't have to do anything. You're a liar and the truth's not in you. See, I'm not preaching condemnation. I'm preaching Bible. This is why sometimes we don't get invited back. It's all right. There's lots of churches in the world, right? And again, guys, this isn't meant to condemn. This is meant, it, the Bible says to provoke one another unto good works. You know, if, if, if maybe fear is a bit of a motivator for you, get rolling, you know? And what do I mean fear? Not fear of you know, hell or damnation, but there should be a reverential fear of God. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to go to John 15. So we had John 14, 15. Now we're going to go to John 15, 14. John 15, 14 says, you, well, let's go to 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We had somebody message us a while back and was saying, you know, I just don't, I just don't see the love in JGLM. I just don't think Curry talked about this yesterday. I don't feel, I don't see the love. I said, a love goes to the hospital at 3 o'clock in the morning for a dying baby. Love picks up his phone at 4 o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping for a sick person. Love may not be all wishy and washy and lovey-dovey and all that kind of stuff. Most of that's fake anyway. Most of it's emotion. Love travels around the world preaching the gospel on their own dime. Because we're trying to get this truth into people. Our love for people and our love for Christ. They just have a miscued view of what love is. Love isn't fake, phony. This is love. Love is, is a, this is why I honor Curry and his family so much. Love is 40 years of a lot of stuff that they went through that you don't even, that Curry won't even share. From people. Not from the, necessarily the devil, but from people. And I honor that family. And I'll lay down my life for my brother. And it goes on to say in verse 15, and we'll end there. I keep saying that, but anyway. Henceforth. Yeah. I just, I keep thinking of Curry too, because oftentimes he's, he's, oh, we're going to finish up here. Just, just one more thing, and like 20 minutes later. But it's, it's all good. Um, verse 14 says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. That's amazing to me. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And then it, said, and it goes on to say, hey, if you do this, you can be my disciple. If you don't do this, you're not my disciples. See, we automatically think we're just his disciples because we said a prayer. No, you're my friends if you do what I told you to do. If you love me, you'll do what I told you to do. And if you do those things, then you can be my disciple. That's amazing. See, people don't like that because we just have this, this inclusion doctrine that, you know, God is love. Is God love? Absolutely is love. For sure he is. But we have this inclusion doctrine thing that, you know, that everybody's just saved and everybody's just free. And it's almost, it's almost like free love with Christ. And it's, it is and it isn't. But you know what I mean by that? Like free love means, that oh, everything goes. It's not that way. God's love is free. But, but it costs Jesus his life. And it costs you your life too. You know, so in that sense, it's not free. You don't have to pay for it. But he wants your whole life. 
See, we're always singing and praying, you know, God, I want more of you. I want more of you. I want more of you. And God's just saying, yeah, I'm singing the same song over you. I want more of you. We don't get more of God. We don't need more of God. There is no more of God because we're the fullness of him that fulfills all in all. When I learned that stuff, I, I, like I said, I stopped going from a beggar to a conqueror. And I was a beggar under the beggarly elements of the world following religion. And now I'm more than a conqueror. Now I'm stepping on devil's throats and faces and all over the world. And we're just, we haven't even, I tell people all the time, we might have seen the iceberg at this point in time. But we've just been coming down the road. I want the whole iceberg. We haven't even necessarily the tip of, tit, touched the tip of the iceberg to what God's going to do in our lives. And I know it. I know we're going we're gonna to see stuff. I'll end right here, I promise. We were in Portland recently with Curry, and this lady came up. And like I said, I don't really take things just all willy-nilly. But she came up to my wife and I separately. She was hunting me down. I was with Curry. We were doing all this stuff going around. And she finally tracked me down, I think, late at night. Last night, it was pitch black outside. And she said, I want to tell you something. I said, okay. I'll listen. doesn't mean I'm, you know, I can hear you, but it doesn't mean I'm listening to you. And she said, I want to, I want to tell you something. God showed me something about you, you and your wife. Okay. She said, I see, someone I had, was talking about it earlier, uh, constructive miracles. I see arms, limbs, things like that growing back under your ministry. I'll take that. Have I seen that physically yet? No, I haven't. But will I accept that? Yeah, because that's biblical. The Bible says you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Well, somebody who doesn't have, you know, a part of their body or a kidney or something like that, that's, that they're not right. They're not whole. They're not well. So I'll take that. So someone said that to me, and I'm going to hold that because that's a promise from God. The devil's not going to promise that. God promised that. So you said it. I'm here. Let's get it done. This is all I want to see. I want to see the miraculous things of God to change a nation. Well, because I'm from Canada, but to change a world. To see the undeniable things. Because people can deny scripture. But when you see stuff that the old timers saw, Jack Coe and, and Wigglesworth and John Lake and all these different things, 42,000 people would go out to Jack Coe's meetings. Because they saw the hospitals, the police, ambulances would bring people in on stretchers because they were on their last breath and they'd get up. We're going to see that again, I promise you. That is going to happen. But God needs every single one of us to do that. People get like Jack Coe died at 38 years old because he burnt himself out praying for people three or four or five times a day. You know, and people say, well, God, you know, how come God didn't keep him in perfect health? Sometimes it's harder for someone to have faith for themselves than it is for somebody else. Especially when you're pouring out to everybody else, you don't consider yourself. Even it says that about Abraham, I think it was, that he considered not his own body. He, considered, he didn't consider himself. Most people that are doing this don't consider themselves because they're so busy considering you. So sometimes they get tired and sometimes they get, you know, they need some breaks or whatever the case may be because there's, they're pouring out constantly. And people say, well, you know, it must be, the, must be a glorious life traveling around the world preaching the gospel. Yeah, it's wonderful getting up at 3.30 in the morning to get on an airplane. And we, 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 we fly, uh, you know, in the very back of the plane like it's like a, a Walmart shopping cart, you know. We get up before everybody else. We go to bed later than everybody else. You know, we, sometimes we go, you know, an entire day without eating or, or you know, two, three days without sleeping, just traveling. That's, that's what we do. So is there parts of it that are fun? Sure, of course that's true. We always try to book an extra day or two coming here and there, and that's why we went down to New Orleans to see some stuff or whatever. Um, but you get tired. But God keeps you going. I will never quit. I will never surrender. So this is why we need to be praying for one another um, and, and keep going because, you know, and, and that's what happens to people. Like Curry said yesterday, sometimes the thing that you beat the most is the thing that can come back to you. Um, and and you know, we need to make sure that we're fighting for ourselves as much as we're, you know, fighting for you. But we don't do that. I, I, like Curry said, I never pray for myself. I'm always busy for praying everybody, everybody else. And this is not, I'm not saying, hey, listen, you know, come and pat me on the back. I'm not saying that at all. We're giving our life for the truth because Jesus gave his life for the truth. Okay? So God bless you guys. See you sometime, 2 o'clock or something.